Hello, everyone. Today we are doing part one of the landscape curriculum. But first, if your studio habits need a kick in the butt, Art Prof has everything you need, tutorials, critiques, and professional development. So Clara, how about you get us started? We are very excited with all the new landscapes content. For example, we now have a free landscapes track that you can do at your own pace. And we also are doing registration this week for premium tracks, including a new premium track focusing on landscapes and backgrounds. We are also offering an anatomy premium track and a painting basics. Links are in the YouTube video description below if you'd like to register and work closely with us for six weeks. There are many aspects of landscape to consider. We're gonna go over the building blocks of that today. The first one is color. Color seems fairly straightforward with landscapes, but you know what? The sky is not always blue. Why do people fall into those traps, Kat, with landscape? Well, people fall into that trap for colors in general. When they see a red apple, they think, oh, it is red. But in fact, a red apple is affected by the light, by shadow, by things around the apple. So it's never just red. It's always a red and something else. It's never its local color. And the same thing for landscapes. People think landscapes are boring. The sky is blue and the grass is green. Well, in fact, <laughs> Depending on the time of day, depending on the weather, depending on the atmosphere, color changes drastically in a landscape and can tell a better story if you have a very specific color scheme. And other times, the landscape literally is a crazy color. Lauren, I know you've traveled in Colorado. I live in Utah. And some of these landscapes you see out here, they don't look real. Have you had that experience, Lauren? Yeah, the color in the West, in the Western part of the United States, is very otherworldly compared to where I live in New England. Where I live in New Hampshire, everything is green. But in Colorado, you've got pigments that are, that are coming from, from the rocks. And so you get all these reds and yellows and, and sometimes even these really iridescent browns on those canyons there. And the sky is totally affected, too, by whatever is on the ground. Like, I am in a city right now. It's very gray. The sky is, is, uh, is not even a color. It's, it could be white, but it's, it's something weird right now. Ginger Cell says, I feel like sometimes people don't see the hidden colors in nature. Absolutely. You really do, if you are painting on site, you need to train your eye to find those colors. And what I find is just people make assumptions. That's a tree, therefore it's green. It's not, there's so many crazy colors. And of course, if you're making imaginary landscapes like Alexis Rockman does these dystopian future history landscapes, you can get even crazier. Like Kat, what is it about this almost electric green? It doesn't seem like it belongs there, but it works for this type of landscape. Well, this whole landscape is supposed to be fantastical and therefore the colors should match the mood that the story is. And that electric green, it makes me think of an alien landscape and something underwater. I mean, anything underwater is already really bizarre, <laughs> but added into the sci-fi setting, you gotta really push how strange it is. Yeah. And you can see this image feels like the world is falling apart. It's all orange and red. And so color definitely sets a mood for the type of landscape. It's not the same thing as wandering around in Bryce Canyon in Utah. There's so many different ways to do that. Now, sometimes colors are somewhat determined by artists. For example, Calvin and Hobbes, when it was in newspapers, the color palette was set in that you only had these purples. You couldn't just pick whatever you wanted in Photoshop. And Lauren, that creates sort of a challenge that I think some artists really had a lot of fun with. I think what Bill did for Calvin and Hobbes is amazing. I always love the color palettes in those comics. They 
really set a kind of nostalgia to them that I love. And yeah, I when I start a painting, I do a lot of landscape painting and I almost always start with doing that limited palette as a challenge to see, oh, where can I take this? What new thing can I do with the mood and the color to transform this landscape? Let's talk about the horizon line. More typically speaking, it's a component of linear perspective. So for example, the horizon line equals the eye level, and it's where the sky meets the ocean. If you're at the beach and Michael Fassbender is there and you're looking at the horizon line, that's what that is. But in landscape where you don't have buildings or anything that's geometric, Kat, what does the horizon line serve in a landscape like this, the photographer Hiroshi Sujimoto? It really grounds you in space. It is sort of that character that you can always count on to like help you understand where you are in the space. And when you don't have buildings, if you don't have anything in the landscape, that horizon line is your focal point. What about here, Lauren? This is Avon Earl, who did some of the really early concept art for Disney. I believe this is a shot from Sleeping Beauty. This is not as simple as Sujimoto's pieces, and yet the horizon line is still really important here. How is Earl doing that, Lauren? It's very strong and it's super flat. So it has this feeling of stability and groundedness to it. It can support these really large objects like these tree trunks coming out of the ground. And that makes me think about how the, the curvature or the lack of curvature, the character of your horizon line really changes how that's going to affect the viewer. Is it crooked? Is it flat? These are, that is equally important to where the horizon line is on the page. Now in Earl's pieces, you can see that the horizon line is really clear cut, well-defined, sharp edges. But then you have people like Oscar Kokoschka, who's very painterly and expressionistic. And I feel like in his work, the horizon line is more implied. And so the horizon line does not always have to be so obvious, but it's a structure that is in pretty much every landscape. But you may choose to ignore it altogether or base your whole body of work on the horizon line. I mean, look at Thomas Seguros. These are his remembered landscapes, so they're imagined out of his head. And I imagine, Kat, the horizon line was almost this anchor for all of these imagined landscapes. What do you think? I agree. It serves as something to structure your image around and your space around. It's sort of like when you draw a human figure, when you draw muscles and bony landscapes and everything, you want to infer that there's bone underneath. There's a structure, right? And then there's skin and then there's muscles and everything else. The landscape painting, for landscape painting, the horizon line is something similar to a skeleton. I'm curious, tell us in the chat, how many of you work with landscape? How many of you want to? How many of you think it's boring? Because if you think it's boring, uh-uh. <laughs> you better start doing some study because landscapes are absolutely exciting and thrilling. Now, Lauren, what about this artist? There is no super clear horizon line. It's not really implied. Why is it in this category? I like Mohammed Abla's work because he makes the conscious choice not to include a horizon line. And that really defines what the viewer's angle and positioning is within the landscape. It feels like we are looking down at a crowd of people. It creates a magnitude, makes me feel like I'm in a skyscraper or I'm a bird. And so that is also really important to choose not to have a horizon line really defines what your viewer's angle or, or spectatorship is going to be. Brianna's making a list of names. Well, guess what, Brianna? You can access all of our slideshows for free. The link is in the YouTube video description below, and we also have them listed on artprof.org. Let's talk about weight. And when we talk about weight, we're talking about physical weight because 
depending on the landscape, certain parts of the landscape are really heavy looking. For example, this is a hill moving upwards and the hill looks really solid and thick. But then if you look at, there are these just lovely willow trees that are just falling down. Those look very light in weight. And this is one of those things, it's not that easy to define, but it is important to think about. So if you're doing a landscape cat, how would you think about weight as you were making the piece? Well, I would think about what kind of atmosphere the piece is in. Usually if it's an atmosphere on earth, everything is affected by gravity. And I have to think about things that take up the landscape, such as mountains or trees or figures like people and consider how much weight does this have compared to this figure. For instance, if I were to paint a mountain and I want to put a human figure in there too, I really have to be conscious to try to make the mountain look heavier, right? Lauren, what about an image like this by Turner? There are not super visible, recognizable objects. Like here we've got buildings and people and mountains, but this is really abstract. And so how do you apply the idea of weight to an image like this? Weight would be the contrasts happening and how intense those contrasts are. It really becomes a, a compositional element. And the weight is, and the gravity is going to be where your eye is pulled down into that movement. So in this image here, it is that dark area there on the left that my eye is getting sucked in towards and I wanna to see what's going on in there. So take a look at landscape paintings and ask yourself, what's heavy, what's medium, what is floating up to the sky? I feel like this is one of those concepts that people don't think about very much. Horizon line and color I think are a little bit more straightforward, but I think especially in a landscape, you do have to think about weight, not just in the individual pieces, but how they relate to each other. For example, in this painting, the trees feel heavier than the mountains, even though technically in real life, the mountains would be the heavier part of the piece. Let's talk about lighting. Kat, why is lighting so critical in any landscape, regardless of whether it's fantastical or painted on site? <laughs> all you need to see <laughs> and you need light to see but also light can tell as much of a story in a landscape as the landscape itself such as this painting or this painting <laughs> by Georgie Ness what does that lighting say about this landscape is it 12 p.m midday I don't think so it's more like it's twilight right so these lighting situations can give a very different mood to the landscape it really is worth it if you don't have a lot of training about how light and shadow works to take a look at our streams on shadows and highlights because lighting can make or break a landscape. Do you agree, Lauren? Yeah, I think that lighting changes the entire tone of a painting or whatever you're making. Again, I'm looking out my window now, everything is gray and flat, it's really blah. I don't really feel like looking at it. It looks boring because there's not a lot of contrast, but I can tell you at golden hour at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. when that light is creating these very heavy shadows and that beautiful color as the sun goes down, oh, it feels so romantic. I say, wow, I'm so lucky to be here. Look at, look at what man has made with all these great buildings, wow very effective. And Kat, it becomes very interesting when people start making fantastical landscapes. So for example, this is Tangi, I'm probably mispronouncing that, obviously a surrealistic landscape. And yet, how does lighting play a role in these landscapes, Kat? It really gives, I mean, it's surrealist, essentially, it kind of makes me feel as if there's the bright fluorescent lights, but also there's fog somehow mixed into the landscape. Taking these sort of disparate elements, like you would never see fog in a room with fluorescent lighting. 
naturally, right? But in these paintings, since they are so fantastical and surrealist, you're able to mix these elements and sort of play on the mood and play on the viewer's expectations in this way. And this is where understanding what a cast shadow is, how it functions within the space, that's where that formal training really comes in handy because I sometimes feel like I'm cheating when I paint on site. Everything's done for me. Like I don't have to think about what color or what, well, I do have to think about color, but I don't think about lighting. Lighting's done for me. And that's why it's important to be able to identify it and what it's doing because natural light is not the same thing as artificial light. I mean, they're like night and day, Lauren. I mean, how do you think about them as being different? The lighting, for instance, in those surrealist pieces we were just looking at, it feels as if there is a, it's flash photography. And you can think about, I think people that work in film think a lot about how something is lit to create a, a space or a narrative. And so you can tell if you're inside or outside, if it's bleary, like you're just opening your eyes, or things are super clear and, and hard edged, and there's that anxiety to it. So there's really a lot built into these various lighting situations that you can use. I mean, I feel like whole films would collapse without their lighting crew, because sometimes people don't spend a lot of time on lighting. And my argument is for every film that's out there, there's a whole crew of people to design the lighting, to get the equipment. And especially in a film like this, this is from 2006. It's a film by Darren Aronofsky. It's a fantastical film, but the lighting is super weird. Like what's happening here, Kat, in the still? <laughs> Who knows? It sort of looks like a <laughs> weird alien blast aura kind of light coming out from the tree. And then there's atmospheric light going on in the back that looks like space, outer space. A lot of different elements going on here. <laughs> I just want to note also, you know who's in this movie? so young at this movie. This is from 2006. But anyway, sometimes having a figure in that space and the lighting on the figure matches the lighting in the space. That's the key to lighting in a landscape is you need it to be consistent with the conditions that you're coming up with. I just want to give a shout out to Note for the super chat, super sticker. Thank you very much. Thank you. We greatly <laughs> appreciate your support. So lighting is one of those things. Don't skip it. it. It's got to be an integral part of every landscape. Remember, we are doing registration for our premium tracks this week. Registration is due on Friday. Let's talk about texture. Lauren, what role does texture have in landscape? It is the way that our eyes categorize information besides lighting and, and gravity and all these other things we're talking about. So trees, they have a bunch of leaves on them, but we're not looking at every single leaf. We're looking at these leaves as a collective or even these trees as a collective. And that creates a texture that's contrasted with say, the texture of the sky, which can be very smooth if it's a clear day, or it can be poofy and, and fluffy if there's clouds there. And Kat, I feel like oftentimes the way to achieve texture in a landscape has a lot to do with how you handle the material. Because a lot of people would assume with something like Chinese brush painting, oh, it's very flowy and very light. And, but that's not the case in a lot of these Chinese paintings. How do they create the texture with something that usually is so flowy and soft? Well, there are different ways to handle this medium. I think first you really need to understand the medium, which means logging hours with the medium. So practicing a lot, essentially. And through practicing, learning how the medium wants to be used. So sometimes it can be flowy. People think, oh, water painting, water ink, calligraphy should be flowy, which is true. But 
you can make the brush a little drier, you can make the ink a little thicker, you can use it and use your brush in ways that can make a stippling effect. So really logging the hours and understanding the medium is the way to be able to create different textures. We've got a bunch of super stickers here, one from RB Dick and Anna, who's been looking forward to this stream. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. We need your support to keep ArtProf up and running. We rely entirely on donations. ArtProf is free for you, but it's not free for us. We have a million expenses. We've got staff to pay. We need your support. Lauren, how about this? Because this is Blueberries for Sal, a children's book by Robert McCloskey from 1948. And this is done with flat graphic shapes. You wouldn't think this would show a lot of texture, and yet it does. Can you explain why this has texture? This book, first of all, was one of my favorites and one of the ones I can remember most from when I was a kid. And the illustrations are super important. They're super beautiful. The way that he articulates the blueberry leaves is very specific. And when I go out blueberry picking, I still recall the images from this book and the way those leaves are organized in those illustrations. And also you've got a bear that comes in there. I don't know if we've got the bear images in the slideshow, but the bear's got this cute fluffy fur and that's, bears can be scary, but it, it, he manages to make this bear look very sweet and cute. So the texture really plays a big role in how the story and the emotion of the story flows. I also feel like sometimes with figurative painting or an illustration like this where the people are very prominent, it's easy to not look at the landscape. But the thing is, if you were to take the landscape away, you really would lose half the image. I mean, the whole point of the story is that they're going blueberry picking. That's the premise is that landscape. So I would say you don't have to have an image that has no people in it for it to be about the landscape. The landscape is so often, it's a storytelling tool. And Kat, I'm not sure that people think about that very often. I think sometimes the landscapes get taken for granted. What do you think? Right, and along with landscapes, backgrounds in general, people tend to focus on the main characters of their own stories, of their own images, but main characters need supporting characters. Main characters need a world they live in. What are those? Are their backgrounds? Are their landscapes? <laughs> And I love how you can get landscapes like this by John Martin. He was an English romantic painter. He was an illustrator and an engraver. And his paintings feel very epic and gigantic and monumental and apocalyptic. And I love his work. But I also love these Winnie the Pooh illustrations where the landscape is barely there. But Lauren, why does it play such a great role in the narrative? It it sets, I mean, it's literally the setting, especially in picture books. You, I guess, as Kat was saying, you need to have a place that they exist in. There's no story without, without the characters interacting with a space. And here, Pooh is looking up at this little dragonfly, and that space in between, the fact that there's nothing articulated in that part of the landscape, makes this really gorgeous moment where Pooh is connecting with that dragonfly. So how much information versus how, how little information you put in is really important. A lot of these landscapes in the Pooh illustrations, they're minimal. This one's a snowstorm, and yet we don't have mountains, we don't have any buildings, but it definitely creates an atmosphere to the images. We've got... <laughs> Speaking of atmosphere, atmospheric perspective. Kat, can you sum up in a nutshell what atmospheric perspective is and why it's so helpful with landscape? Atmospheric perspective is when things closer to you are more saturated in color and clearer and more detailed and things farther from you are more blurry, less saturated. And this way you are able to tell space without there being any linear perspective because the atmosphere does all the work for you. I oftentimes think that atmospheric perspective is my cheat sheet <laughs> because if I'm looking at a landscape in real life, sometimes the stuff in the distance really is clear cut and 
I can see some detail, but I'll just cheat and make it low contrast and make it blurrier. And, and why does that just make space, Lauren? <laughs> Our eyes, the, the way that the science works, I guess, is there's a lot of blue particles, blue light particles or something in between, or that blue light reflect, ref, refracts a lot. And so the further back you go, the less information you get, because there's all this other particle stuff in the air. Think of, I'm, I'm really talking city metaphors today, but think of a city on a smoggy day and there's a lot of dust and dirt in the air, and you can't see what's very far back because all that dirt is clouding up the view. So it's, it's, it's a way that we all categorize information. And you can see it a lot in TV shows and films because the stuff that's in front is very clear and articulate. And then look at the background. The background's very blurry, and so you feel like the background is very far away. I think we need a couple more examples, because I'm not sure that people really caught on to this concept. Because, look, see, it's so blurry in the upper left-hand corner. Oh my god, those eyebrows. <laughs> I'm in season three right now. He doesn't show up until season five. But I'm, I'm earning it, because... <laughs> anyway... How about this one, Kat? This is Hilary Brace. She does these wonderful charcoal drawings. And some people might say, oh, these are so realistic. I don't think they are at all. I think she messes with so many things here. So what's going on in terms of atmospheric perspective, Kat? It all feels like it's a little bit far away, except for maybe the ripples on the very bottom. Those feel kind of clear. But overall, with atmospheric perspective, Hillary Brace is able to portray a grand space. If you were to see this image crystal clear and hard lines everywhere, I would feel a lot more physically close to that space. I wouldn't feel like this was so grandiose, but since everything is a little bit blurry because of the atmospheric perspective, it feels majestic. And Lauren, I do feel that space and landscapes some of it is your mindset, because I imagine for Hillary Brace to make these fantastical landscapes, she probably had to have something in her head that she'd organized how the space works. Where is a pocket of negative space? Where is something being occupied? Do you do that, Lauren, when you paint a landscape, really think spatially about what's going on? Yeah, I do. And I think a lot about, I have a lot of different influences bopping around in my head. So we've talked about cinema a little bit. And I think about cinema a lot when I'm organizing an image and organizing a space, what techniques are used that, that macro look versus the, the more, uh, what do you call it, wide angle kind of thing. Um, so it, it depends what you're looking at too, how you how you end up categorizing or organizing space in your images. I do think the more typical atmospheric perspective look is something like this, blurry and soft, and usually you have a lot of smudging and stuff like that, but. Kat, this is a wonderful graphic novel by Jillian Tamaki and Mariko Tamaki, and there's not a lot of smudging in here. In fact, a lot of the landscapes are pretty graphic, and yet why does the atmospheric perspective still come across? Well, everything that's more detailed comes forward, but then there are ways that the illustrator push things back. So in this case, anything that's pushed back becomes darker and therefore you see less. But in the previous page, anything that was pushed back was brighter. It was actually just white space and you're left to sort of imagine what that landscape could be. I think one of the points we're trying to make is that style does not determine how the landscape works as far as these concepts go. Because I think there are assumptions that atmospheric perspective should look like this. This is more your typical atmospheric perspective. This is Norman Ackrod, contemporary British painter, and not painter, printmaker. He does a lot of aquatints and stuff like that. So I feel like in his work, the atmospheric perspective, it's so easy to identify. It's got crisp trees in the front, smoky fog in the back, 
But as we've seen with that graphic novel, things don't have to be that way all the time. Let's talk about scale. Why does scale matter in a landscape, Warren? Sometimes with landscapes, it can be hard to know what you're looking at or where your positioning is. And having something recognizable for scale allows us to figure out, okay, what is our importance as the viewer in this artwork? And so in Bruegel's images here, the people are somewhat small, but they're still big enough to be a, a subject matter, to be a, a centering in the story. But it's clear that the landscape is quite large and that maybe there is an adventure ahead, a challenge ahead. So in this image here, there's some hunting going on and it looks like they're setting forth because the landscape is so, so large in the right side of the frame. Yeah, just having figures of different sizes immediately shows you depth. I, I feel like it's so easy. How can you not do it <laughs> if you're making a landscape? And you can see in Bruegel's painting, it's not just scale, it's combined with atmospheric perspective. So all the concepts we're talking about here, there's a ton of overlap. So Kat, why is it the atmospheric perspective and the scale is like a double whammy in this landscape? <laughs> because it really gives you context how big things are and how far away things are. Once there's atmospheric perspective, you already know, okay, it's far enough for it to be kind of blurry. I've lived in this world long enough to know how far away that is. <laughs> and then you have the people in the foreground and you think, wow, that tree is actually very large. Without the people, I wouldn't have understood how large that tree was. So you get space and you get context. Because I do think with landscape, scale can be tough to figure out, especially if it's mountains. I never really thought mountains were that great because <laughs> I lived in Massachusetts and there's no mountains unless you drive to New Hampshire. And I remember my husband would go to New Hampshire, he's like, these are not mountains. These are like poser mountains. And then I like come to you, I'm like, oh, I see. This is on a whole other scale. So Lauren, how about Peter Doig? I chose Peter Doig as someone for scale because he has a consistent element that he uses in his artworks. He always puts these people in boats. He's a hundred pictures of people in boats, but the boat changes. Sometimes it's really big, sometimes it's really small, and the elements in the landscape shift with that. It's always in different proportions. So in this image here, the boat is huge. It's almost like a horizon line unto its own. It is a land mass here. And that is juxtaposed against this very, very tiny, far away land mass. So it really emphasizes the distance between the person and the place that maybe ultimately they have to go. Whereas here, this is maybe a little bit more balanced. The, the landscape is, is fairly close. That tree is, is a comfortable distance between the people there in that boat um, and, and the end of that, that shore there. Now, this is Con Selesnik. This is a collaborative team. They do lots of photography and installations. And they're great to look at as well because they repeat motifs, like what's happening here with the boats, Cat. Well, the boats are going off. I think they're ice sledding or something. And they're going off into space towards this iceberg. And as you said, Clara, the best part about this piece is the motif. We know how big the first sailboat is, but then as they go off into space, we start to get a better context of how far away they are. Yeah, and so sometimes just the same figures, these odd masked figures that you see and go back into the distance, it makes the whole piece. Like if we take the figures away, it's not really that exciting as a landscape, but the figures create and organize that space for us. Now, Lauren, how about somebody like Grandma Moses? Because all her figures are small. She's not quite as blatant as Bruegel is, about oh, big people in the front, little people in the back. And yet her figures serve a very important purpose in her landscapes. I think that her figures and the size of the space feels more 
narratively oriented. So there's that amount of space because she can have many different things going on within that. And these people are integrated into the, into the scenery really well. They are a part of the landscape and, and the daily happenings, the everyday life within that landscape. We've got some thoughts from Totoro Me. Landscape might be an important feature, but both artists manipulated things differently, one with more realism and one created depth, but Doig implemented it. He manipulates the scale differently in a more homogenous way compared to the last artist. I think it's great, Totoro, that you are making comparisons between these different landscape artists, because I think identifying what one artist does one way, an artist does another way. That analysis really helps you understand how all of these elements function within the context of landscape. We do have an art prof share today. This is where we share the work that people in the community are doing based on our content. And today we have somebody who did the color track. Our tracks are a series of video lessons and prompts. They're free. You can do them at your own pace. And today we are looking at Neil, who is an 18 year old self-taught artist in the Philippines. And Neil says, I don't consider myself a color expert. I'm not afraid of it, but I'm definitely not a master. And Neil says, my approach to color is intuitive and quite barbaric, <laughs> which I love. I don't know about theory and physics. I just pick the colors and hope that it works out. And Neil says the prompt that surprised me was the painted paper collage prompt, which was designed by Lauren. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. So Kat, sometimes complementary color charts feel like a lot of work, but I find them incredibly helpful, this particular exercise. And how did Neil do with these? Oh, I think Neil did great because, I mean, everybody thinks that complementary color charts and color charts in general are boring. And I agree but they can be very helpful to see the nuance. So when you think complementary, yellow and purple, I know what those look like, but then you don't realize that yellow and purple can look so different when you mix one with more of the other and vice versa. So you can really see nuance in these color charts. And then we have people really exploring complementary colors. And I just love seeing Neil's progression with this green underpainting, working the reds on top. I mean, this is such a luscious painting, especially those lime green tips at the bottom. And then Lauren, you designed this project, which is to take an image of a room and then to paint papers, different colors and different patterns, and then collage them together. How did Neil do? Neil did great. I should say first that I stole this assignment from my teacher, Matt Bollinger, who did lots of painted paper collage. But I think Neil did a really, really excellent job, blew it out of the water here. I think that that blue that he's using for the walls, really, he's using weight with that brown to contrast it with that brown. So we're really looking straight down into all the details of his space. And I, I just think it's gorgeous. And I want to point out, by the way, <laughs> this is Neil's second track <laughs> that he's finished. He already finished the Drawing Basics track, and he's so on a roll. And this work is just outstanding. This is a project you do a complement color underpainting. So for a person with flesh tone, you would have a blue underpainting, and then it creates just these gorgeous relationships mm -hmm. and then this one oh my god neil did such a great job so you pick a movie still you select the colors and so neil actually did some thumbnails and then he picked colors from encanto and then created this what do you think kat oh this is so excellent it this room is in a very specific place at a very specific time. I think it's golden hour. I mean, in the Encanto image, it looks like it's golden hour. And Neil has sort of taken that atmosphere from Encanto and just infused it into his own image. That's completely his own, his entire own image. And Neil, I love what you said about being barbaric, about choosing your colors, because honestly, I feel like that is how you should choose colors. There's no formula to this. You can do all the color charts that you want. You can certainly learn from them, but you're not going to be able to think about color in such a logical way. It's sort of like when you draw 
a landscape <laughs> and you focus on linear perspective and measuring every single point and measuring every little corner, you can do that. But I feel like it's better when you sort of choose and pick and make up stuff on your own and then creating your own style from that. So Neil, I think you have done such an excellent job on this color track. I'm sure you've learned a lot about color and also about your style. Yeah, I just want to say too that so much of this is about that confidence. And I remember when Neil first came into doing Art Prof and was buying his first sets of, of colors and was just, was not confident at all, was just asking a lot of really good questions, but, but was just starting. And now he's like a master making suggestions for other people, creating these beautiful images that really set a, a move like I want to live in that space that that last little assignment there it's so pretty <laughs> so I just we're really proud of you Neil you've done a lot of work and it clearly shows and we have several people who have finished tracks and you can go to artprof.org you can click on the various links and you can see everybody's slideshow their Instagram post their video feature is very inspiring. And people are in the Discord, they're working together, egging each other on. So join because it's a really fun experience. I hope you will join Kat and I, we will be in the Discord in the stage channel. And a stage session is where you can talk to Kat and I on voice. And you don't have to talk, you can totally just hang out and listen, but it's a great time to ask us questions and we love hearing the voices, so we hope that you will all join us. There are many ways you can support ArtProf. You can make a one-time donation on PayPal if you want to purchase an artist call to speak to one of our staff to get customized advice. And we've got our wonderful list of top Patreon supporters. Our newest supporter is Tiffany Lim Tan. Thank you all for that. But I'm a little sad this week because we went down so much. And I'm just, oh, this just hurts me. I'm so grateful for people that are contributing. But when it just keeps going <laughs> down, it makes me want to cry, Lauren. Uh, we were so close prof to 4,000. The art prof stonk went down. We have to raise the art prof stonk. Well, I, I'm just extra sad because for a little while we were at 4,000 and I was so happy to be at that milestone. And now we're below, for, it's just making me really, really sad because as I said, Art Prof is free for you. All of our content is 100% free, but it's so not free for us. There's so many expenses that you just would not it's, believe we have to pay for. It's tax season, guys. Yeah. <laughs> we have to pay taxes. We do. We have to pay for a lot of things. So we hope you consider supporting us so we can keep the lights on. Our Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And subscribe to our channel for more art tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.